payments to you. Do you recognize what those are? Yes, these look like his Rutherford County school records. Okay, and Your Honor, I'd like to make these the next exhibit. No further questions. No. Okay. Must you be excused? Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Any additional testimony from the defense? No, Your Honor. Okay, the defense rest. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, I hate to have you do this, but I need you to step out for just a short time. Do not discuss this case. Do not form an opinion. Uh, and we'll have you right back in as soon as we can. All right, so just leave your notebooks in your chair. So, Ms. Thompson, you're not calling the defendants as a witness? Correct. Okay. All right, Mr. Sampson, if you'll step up to the microphone. Raise your right hand and be sworn. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give to be true and correct? Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Motlaw, you have a right to testify in your sentencing hearing. It's going to be your choice. I just want to make certain that you have discussed this with your attorney uh, about the pros of doing that, the cons of doing that, and it is your decision not to testify. Is that correct? It is. Okay, all right. Well, and I believe there's a form that you had to sign to make to kind of just go over what I just said. You have an absolute right to testify. You also have a right to make what we call an allocution, uh, but you're choosing not to do that either. Is that correct? Okay, all right. And you have the form yes. signed? Okay. Well, we'll make this part of the record. All right, Mr. Sampson, you can have a seat. back in oh, okay while we're doing that um, how long is the state's witness going to take no more than 10 minutes, ten minutes and then cross-examine well after that's over do you think you'll have any rebuttal or do you know I don't know who the witness is going to be so. okay well what I'm saying is if it's very short can we just go straight into the argument I think we can yeah well we can we'll, get set up for over we can do that quickly. Yes. Okay. All right. So we can do that after you finish your, your thing. All right. Well, let's bring them back. They're ready. Thank you for your patience. Uh, the jury is now back in the courtroom. Uh, so, does the state have any rebuttal testimony at this yes, time? Yes, Your Honor. This state calls Buford Tune. Okay. Buford Tune. Okay. Sworn, do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give to be true and correct? I do. Okay. All right, Joe. Would you please state your name and spell your first name and your last name for the it's record? James Buford Tune, T-U-N-E, B-U-F-O-R-D. Okay. 
And Mr. Toon, where do you work? I own the Academy of Personal Protection and Security. Can you tell the jury what that is? We train law enforcement security officers for the state of Tennessee, probably in the neighborhood of around 70 different companies statewide and southeast. Okay. And if somebody were to get a security guard license, is that something that they could do through your company? That's correct. Before you became the owner of the Academy of Personal Protection and Security, what did you do for a living? I was a police officer. And what did you do for the police department? I was in the tactical division, bomb squad, special operations, scuba teams. How long were you a police officer? 30 years. I want to call your attention to this particular case. Are you familiar with the defendant, Emmanuel Sampson? Yes, I am. How are you familiar with him? Uh, the Friday before the shooting at the church, he came into the class for the unarmed security portion of that class. Can you tell the jury what that entails? Well, state law says you got to have a minimum of four hours, which we all think is ridiculous to be a security officer. Uh, we do six to eight hours, depending on the number of people, questions, and answers. Uh, we go through report writing, demeanor, uh, dealing with people, uh, you know, it's a lot easier to talk to people than it is to put them in jail. Try to keep your hands off of them as much as possible. It's just tons of information that's given in that small length of time that should be longer. So they receive instruction from you or somebody else from your company. Correct. And then at the end of that, do they have to take a test? They do. Did the defendant, Emmanuel Sampson, take a test in your class? Yes, he did. And how did he do on that? He test? scored 100%. You seem to remember him very well. Very well. Can you tell the jury what um, impressed upon you, what was impressed upon you that makes you be able to remember so well this defendant? His demeanor, his dress, uh, his size. Uh, most of the security people we get coming in are not quite as big as him. Uh, some of them, I don't know how to put it, has the. Uh, uh, big boy attitude, and they wind up getting hurt on the streets. Uh, but he was, uh, at that time, he had very short hair, uh, dressed very nicely, uh, questions and answers. Uh, I mean, he, you couldn't ask for a better person. Okay. And just for the record, the person that you know is Emmanuel Sampson. Is that person here in the courtroom today? Sitting right there. Only and, his hair is longer. Okay. And can you say um, what it is that he's wearing? Uh, he's wearing a... I think it's a navy blue suit, tie, white shirt, dreadlocks. Your Honor, may uh, the record reflect that he's identified the defendant, Emmanuel Sampson? Did he have an opportunity to actually speak in class? Uh, not to me, um, but we had, uh, I can't remember what his name was now. Uh, we had one student in there, he's 18 years old, just got out of high school, and he was wanting to get him a real quick job. And uh, he was in the back of the room, which we try to make every move towards the front if possible. And I kept noticing he was taking notes, and I also noticed there was no paper. And so I got on I, my phone, my text message up on my podium, and I text my office manager to come in the back door and see what this guy's doing. Well, he was drawing pictures on the desk, which, you know, we sit there going, what are you doing? And she come in with paper towels and made him clean the desk up. Well, he started running his mouth, at which time this gentleman over here told him, said, you need to quieten down. You need to pay attention in this class and listen because it may save your life. So I'm going, wow. I mean, there was nothing. Uh, after we, he was working for a, a Crimson Security at the time, and they're owned by two paramedics out of Smyrna very high-end security company. I called them and told them what kind of job he did. I said, I'd hired him in a heartbeat. Okay. Um, did he appear to be hearing voices in his head or responding to voices he was hearing in his head? Not that I know of, only me. Okay. And did he have a hard time staying awake while he was in class? No, ma'am, he sure did not. Have you had the opportunity in both um, your... Um, owning of the Academy of Personal Protection and Security and also as a police officer to observe people's demeanor. Oh, yes, all um, the time. And was there anything out of the ordinary about this particular defendant other than the, what you've just said was extraordinary? No. I mean, it's, 
he was very polite, very nice, uh, wasn't any problems out of him whatsoever. And my, may I see exhibit number 51, please? It's, which has already been pulled, Your Honor. Opening up, Mr. Toome, what's already been introduced into evidence as exhibit number 51. And I'm opening up a pouch from exhibit number 51. Does this look like a familiar document to you? Yes, ma'am. What is this? That's one of our um, sheets that they have to fill out to attend the classes and so forth. They have to read it uh, down at the bottom. It has some of the laws on it that they have to go by as well. And I'm showing you this document. Okay, that's a sales receipt by my office manager, Teresa Davis, where a class was paid for. Okay, and what is the date of the class? September the 22nd, 2017. And you said your class lasts five or six hours? Uh, six, about six to eight hours, depending upon the number of people, questions, and answers. Okay, and that day, how many hours did it last? It was uh, probably around 4 o'clock when we left. Starts at 8.30, probably around 4 to 4.30. Okay. Um, and when you did the class, um, it, it it's something that's required for people that are going to be an unarmed security officer, yeah, is that right? state law, yes, ma'am. So if he had just been, that would make sense if he had just been hired by Crimson Security, is that's that right? That's correct. Okay. And from what you observed, he was polite and cooperative. Correct. Did he seem to have any kind of problems? Um, uh, you just said, I strike that question. You just, um, and so everything you observed, he was pleasant. That's correct. Okay. No further questions. May he be excused? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. You may be excused. Anything further from the state? No, Your Honor. The state rests. Okay. And any rebuttal proof from the defense? No, Your Honor. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that completes the testimony at the at this phase of the trial. We're going to have some closing arguments, uh, and then I'll read you a short charge, and then you can begin your deliberations. Same sort of admonitions that I gave you um, before, statements of counsel's not evidence. You've heard the evidence. Uh, it's just to assist you in understanding the evidence and, and making your determination as to the punishment for count four. So we need to move that in, over here. Okay, that's a good distance. All right, General. Hey, Your Honor, may I see uh, exhibits four and six to this proceeding? To this proceeding? Yes, sir. Four and six, which would be Motlow State um, and the DCS. DCS Motlow State.
Yeah, just one second before yes. my clock starts running. Okay. Thank you. Please accord, council, members of the jury. Not going to hear a whole lot from us. Condensing this down to why is life without parole the appropriate punishment? I submit not just because we're asking for it, not the same as if the defense would be asking for life with parole. What we're asking is do what you believe is the appropriate punishment based on the facts and the law. Aggravating circumstance, I submit, obviously exists beyond a reasonable doubt by your earlier verdict. That being said, and once you do, you would have to find that, certainly not just because I'm saying it, but because I submit it exists in the evidence. Then you can consider the victim impact testimony. What ultimately was a, what we were able to present because of the aggravating circumstance, victim impact. It's not an aggravating circumstance. It's not a reason that you can used to give an enhanced punishment, but it is something you can consider. It is more or less a, a snapshot into the life of Melanie Crow, not from birth or grandparents or anything else, but that, that glimpse into what she brought to this world, to her relatives, her friends, to her church family, and what her loss has meant. Mitigation. Thought about getting a dictionary, putting it out here, you know, something to lessen, to lessen punishment. Defense is entitled, and the judge will tell you, you can essentially consider anything that you've heard from the proof in the case in chief or here today of a reason why he should get a sentence of parole eligibility. And yes, granted, some people might. It's like, well, 51 years from September 24th, 2017. That's going on 49 years from now. Is there really a difference? Yes. So there is in the sense of what is just and what is the appropriate punishment. 49 years from now or, or 51 years from September 24th, 2017, some of those children will probably maybe be in their late 50s, 60s, Maybe some others around. And yes, most of the victims who you saw testify here today will in all likelihood have passed, some sooner than others, unfortunately. But Melanie Crow's seat will still be empty. The people she loved, the family that she left, and the family she will never know will have that void. This man, no matter what your decision is in this phase, will get to visit. People come to visit him. You know, his mother apparently was willing to go to Africa to help out or maybe just coincidentally being there and helping out. If she wants to come visit him, she can. His father, his girlfriend, his sister, he can interact with them. You know, when Melanie Crow's loved ones go to visit her, it's always going to be one-sided in this life. So why does it matter, and what is the mitigation? Dr. Montgomery certainly is an expert. You heard from Buford Toon two days before. Dr. Montgomery saw him a year later. Two days before, in class, six to eight hours, more than the 2.9 not anything. And Buford Toon, I submit, based upon his experience, 30 years as a police officer and doing all this training, 
may not have a medical degree or being a psychiatrist. I suspect he's seen a whole lot in his time and was impressed by the demeanor, the attitude, the responsible person that Emmanuel Sampson appeared to be. Yes, we say the old, I can't but judge a book by its cover. But one of the things, Dr. Montgomery, again, information he's relied on, and that's part of the, the jury charge, the judge will tell you that, you know, base it on what he had, it's hearsay that he got, so it's, how good was that? I think I remember, didn't he say, oh, he did so poorly in psychology, I guess, looks to me like in social psychology, you got a B in life span psychology, and A, I don't know, does that really matter? Oh, in three months, all the horrors he saw in Sudan. Testimony was he left there at three months old, not four or five years old. Uh, granted, maybe a, a United Nations refugee camp isn't you know as great a place as you know some neighborhoods in you know, Brentwood or Belmead or wherever you want to say or if, wherever. But there was no apparently violence there. Family life, yeah, probably could have been better. Got DCS involved for a little bit. They did their investigation. You've got all these, what does it say? CM, case manager, observed no marks or bruises on the child. Doesn't like watching his, watching his baby brothers. Again, just... Maybe means nothing, but if you're going to have somebody come in and testify about facts, let's get the facts right. We only have 20 minutes per side, and I'm going to leave as much time as I possibly can for John Hunter, who will be giving the closing in this phase. We certainly appreciate the days, hours, and it seems like now weeks Y'all have put into this. Why does it matter? It matters because it's, I submit, the right thing to do. Life without the possibility of parole is what the facts of this case and the murder of Melanie Crow deserve. So, I am here today speaking on behalf of Emmanuel Sampson. And what we're here standing in front of you asking for today is grace. We're not asking for what's fair. It's not about what's fair at this point. It wasn't fair that Melanie Crow died. It wasn't fair that the other victims of the church shooting were hurt, injured, scared, frightened. That's not fair. So what we're asking for today is that you please give some grace to Emmanuel Sampson. And let's look at what the proof really is in this situation. So in this situation, the state stands before you and says, well, you heard what Dr. Montgomery said, but... Can you really be certain? Or, you know, they just put doubt about Dr. Montgomery because Dr. Montgomery saw him 11 months later. And in fact, the person that saw him two days earlier says he was very polite. What does that mean? The state was absolutely free to get their own expert. If they thought that they could show that Emmanuel Sampson didn't suffer from schizoaffective no, disorder, I statement move on Ms. Thompson so why didn't we hear that information because it's not
So what the state has brought in here today is a person from a security company. He does training for security company to come in and say that Mr. Sampson was very polite two days before the shooting. I'm sure that's true. Everything that we've ever seen about Mr. Sampson He's polite. I am quiet. He was helpful. Vacation Bible school. He was good and kind to people. The only thing that goes against that that we've ever seen were the events on September the 24th. That's all we saw. And so I'm putting forward to you today that the genuine Mr. Sampson is the Mr. Sampson everybody else talked about. The Mr. Sampson that was there at the church helping with vacation Bible school. The Mr. Sampson that helped with activities. The Mr. Sampson that was trying really hard to be a good student. Uh, you, I'd like to see exhibits one through seven, please. Sentence in here. What we can see is that Mr. Sampson, he, he didn't have a very good record at Motlow State, but he was trying. After all, he'd been attending. Number six is the Motlow State records. So, if you look at these records, you'll see that, in fact, he is having a tough time. Let's see the ones that he took. Can't remember which order they're stapled in. Let's see if I can figure out which quarter this is. So, this is in summer of 2012. I guess this is spring of 2012, so let's see which ones these were. This is the fall of 2010. So he's taking some classes. He makes a BCB, and then in the spring of 2011, he's making a B, two Cs, and two Bs. And um, then he moves on. And you can see that when he first started out, he was doing much better. So now he gets to the gym. you look at what this F-A means, I think it means it's in and that's been his GPA algebra. So his grades, he has a harder time. But I think clearly the state's trying to convince you of somehow Mr. Sampson uh, took a biology, a psychology course in college and was able to somehow uh, falsify or fake being schizoaffective disorder. But I put to you that that is absolutely not true. That Mr. Sampson really does suffer from schizoaffective disorder and that he has features of bipolar disorder. And let's look at some of the other proof that we've had in this case. We've had Dr. Montgomery's report. And Dr. Montgomery did a, a long report in this case. And it just goes, um, the judge will give you an instruction regarding this. But you can see that the report is consistent. Um, and he's looked at a lot of things. You heard Dr. Montgomery testified that he had examined, he'd done over, he testified over a hundred times and done hundreds, perhaps thousands of forensic examinations and that it was his professional opinion to a um, reasonable degree of psycho psychiatric certainty that Mr. Sampson does suffer from these, the, the schizoaffective disorder and that the schizoaffective disorder is significant. 
after all, um, you know, why does somebody go in and commit a first-degree murder? I mean, you as the jury have found that he committed a first-degree murder. Why does he go in and commit a first-degree murder? Let's talk about some of the factors that, that Dr. Montgomery went over in terms of facing his childhood. You know, we want the best for our kids, and we make sure that they go to little lessons, and they have good schools, and they have good teachers, and we make sure that the babysitters that are watching them are good to them, kind to them, and are not abusive. Why do we do that? Because we understand. I mean, Dr. Montgomery talked about these adverse childhood experiences, but we don't need a professional to tell us that because we understand in our basic core that what happens to us when we're kids affects who we grow up to be. We know that as parents. That's why we try to give our kids the best. And now what Dr. Montgomery testified to is we are discovering that, in matter of fact, not only does it affect us how we grow up as parents, it actually affects the wiring in our brains. That because of these experiences, if you have constant negative experiences, constant abuse, and you heard he had six factors. Six factors were divorce in the family, physical violence towards his mother, physical abuse towards him, emotional abuse towards him, emotional neglect towards him, and mental illness of a family member. So he had six out of ten childhood traumas, uh, these adverse childhood experiences, and they do affect the brain. Now, that doesn't mean it's necessarily an excuse for everybody. You know, I'm not, we're not saying that, but it actually affects somebody. It's how they are then able to think it affects the brain chemistry and the neurological connections. They're, so, what that means, we have the records from DCS. We find the records from DCS because those are very interesting. And the state wants you to look at the records and only say, well, they found no marks on him. So the referent called in and reported that 12-year-old Emmanuel said his mother hits him with a belt the latest incident occurred approximately two months ago. Emmanuel has a scar from a belt buckle on his right hand. Emmanuel said his mother hit him with a broom handle a year ago and left a scar on his cheek. Emmanuel is left to watch and care for his four-year-old twin brothers and two-year-old sister every other night while his mother works from 10 p.m. to 12 p.m. Emmanuel says he does not like being alone to babysit the kids, and it upsets him. So... It's not just that he was calling DCS because he had to babysit some and he didn't like being babys babysitting. It's because he's being abused. And so DCS comes out and the case manager interviews him. Case manager, they interview the child on September the 23rd, 2003. Case manager interviewed Emmanuel Sampson at Donald Middle, Donaldson Middle School. Emmanuel says stated to the case manager that his mother whips him with the belt on his butt. He stated his mother hit him with a broom handle on the jaw because he told her he wanted to live with his dad. He stated that this incident occurred about a year ago. Emmanuel stated that he goes to visit his dad in Laverne on weekends and sometimes he doesn't get to go. The case manager observed no marks or bruises on the child. He stated that his older sister, Christina, who is 16, watches them at night while his mother's at work. So collateral interview. Case manager interviewed referent and school counselor Carol Percy at Donaldson Middle School. Ms. Percy says that the case manager said Emmanuel is not happy at home and wants to live with his dad. She stated that he told her that his sister is there often and takes care of them when his mother is at work. Ms. Percy said that Emmanuel feels that his mother doesn't provide for him. She stated that he told her that on one occasion his mother hit him in the face with a belt buckle and with a broom on his face. Ms. Percy stated that Emmanuel's father stated that Ms. Agabi is neglecting the child because he has been left alone and because she told him that he needed clothes or shoes, if he needed clothes or shoes to ask his father. Ms. Percy stated that Emmanuel is not the type of child to cause trouble or get into trouble at school. So here's what the state did. So they had this opportunity. This case manager was unable to contact either parent in this case. Case manager made attempts to visit the home on 923 and 927. 
Case manager sent notification letters on October the 15th and November the 4th. Case manager contacted NES and confirmed that there is electric service in the home. As a result of exhausting all reasonable efforts, the case manager is submitting the case for closure. That's it. She showed up to the house twice. No one's home, so they say, well, it's unfounded. You know, the allegations of abuse are unfounded. But can you imagine what that did to Emmanuel? He knew that the DCS had come out and interviewed him. I mean, what it tells him is, don't open your mouth. Nobody's going to be there for you. It, it doesn't matter what's happened. No one is coming to rescue you. That's what he's being told there. You heard all the qualifications of Dr. Montgomery. Dr. Montgomery is a very qualified psychiatrist. He trains on personality disorders. He's trained almost every physician that's gone through Vanderbilt University for the last 20 years on personality disorders. If you think about some of the other things Dr. Montgomery said, they were significant. Dr. Montgomery said there would be very few people in his practice that would be both on Zyprexa and lithium, and it's a sign of significant mental illness. Because remember, it's not only Dr. Montgomery that's given him a diagnosis. The jail found it necessary to put him on lithium, and then they doubled the dose to 10 milligrams, and then they, um, they added Zyprexa several months later. So the jail also found that it was important. Dr. Montgomery testified that he was suffering from psychosis. He talked a lot about how people with manic, who, um, how manic people can be when they're psychotic. He reviewed the evidence. He looked at a lot of materials in this case. All the police reports, the indictment, interviews with witnesses, interviews with family. He reviewed everything. And so what the state has is they put up someone that saw him two days earlier that's not a psychiatric professional and that says, well, he seemed polite. Well, I'm sure Emmanuel Sampson seemed polite that day. But, you know, you can't always tell. I mean, sometimes you can tell if people have mental illness, but there's plenty of times that you can't tell if somebody has mental illness. Matter of fact, some of you may have people in your family with mental illness. And it not, might not be apparent when you first meet somebody because a lot of times people with mental illness can hold it together for a few hours. But that doesn't mean that they're healthy. We've heard stories about generational trauma in this family. And Emmanuel Sampson may have been three months old when he left Sudan, but he was four and a half before he came to the United States. And during that time, he was living... During that time, he was living in a um, refugee camp in Egypt, and I'm sure that was very hard, but there's generational trauma because his parents were victims of trauma before they came to the U.S. And so what we're asking today is grace for Emmanuel Sampson, that the judge is going to instruct you about mitigating circumstances one of the mitigating circumstances is that is the capacity. So I'm asking you to evaluate the capacity of Mr. Sampson to appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct or to conform his conduct to the requirements of the law, which was substantially impaired as a result of his mental disease or defect, which was insufficient to establish a defense to the crime, but which substantially affected his judgment. And I think Dr. Montgomery certainly talked about that. Um, there's several other the factors that the judge is going to talk to you about, that the murder was committed while the defendant was under the, extreme, the influence of extreme mental or emotional disturbance, and history of his childhood and his family relationships. So his family's not here today to ask you, but I'm standing in the place of his family today. And I'm asking you to please, for Manuel Sampson's sake, give him some grace. And please give him life in prison with the possibility of parole 
after 51 years. I have a couple of slides on a PowerPoint, so I'm just waiting for that to pull up. <laughs> Members of the jury, we heard three hours today approximately from Dr. Montgomery in this case, talking about the defendant's mental health disorders. Dr. Montgomery may as well have been a witness for the state of Tennessee if you really look into what his principal conclusions are in this case. And I would submit to you to summarize that, he would say, or what he did say in his conclusions in his report were that the disorders that he talked about did not cause the defendant to commit the murder of Melanie Crow and his mental health disorders absolutely did not cause him to attempt to kill additional people at the Burnett Chapel Church of Christ and his mental health disorders absolutely did not cause him to terrorize the other people who were in the church on that day. Here's what his conclusions actually said. They said, persons such as Mr. Sampson may develop problems with mediating and controlling their anger. They have extreme and potentially violent reactions to even trivial stimuli. That's borne out by the way the defendant acted on September 24th, 2017. His Conclusion said that Mr. Sampson did wear a mask covering his face and a protective tactical vest during the instant offense. People typically wear masks while committing criminal acts in order to conceal their identity and escape punishment. This suggests that he appreciated the wrongfulness of his actions. He appreciated that it was wrong what he was doing, but he made the decision to go ahead and do it anyway. That's what Dr. Montgomery said. He also says, although he reports no memory of the note found in his car, the content of the note conveys that his actions were intended as payback by targeting Caucasian religious parishioners. This implies that he understood the nature of his actions were to act out a similar racially motivated attack. He goes on. He goes on his, in his report, in his conclusion portion, and says his angry thoughts toward himself were projected outward towards others. You think? He also said his mental disease did not appear to prevent him from appreciating the nature or wrongfulness of his actions or render him incapable of knowing or premeditated actions, which should make you feel comfortable in the verdict that you reached. This is perhaps the most telling portion of his conclusions. His lack of clear memory for the events could be because he was in a dissociative state, but it could also be that he now realizes the gravity of that what he did, of what he did, and knows that he cannot divulge his memory of the events because it would be detrimental to his current situ legal situation. Let that sit in for just a minute and recall the testimony that the defendant gave during this trial when he couldn't remember anything about what happened when it came right down to what it is that he actually did. 
and that is murder an innocent woman, try to murder many additional innocent people in the Burnett Chapel Church of Christ and terrify the others who were not subject to being shot at. He went on to say, Dr. Montgomery did, his actions of wearing a mask, wearing a tactical vest, and writing a note comparing his actions to those of another mass shooter indicate that despite his severe mental diseases, he appreciated the wrongfulness and nature of his actions. That's what the defense expert told you. All due respect to Dr. Montgomery, the state would submit to you that the evidence that was presented in this case do not support that the defendant was suicidal on September 24th, 2017. If you look at all of the evidence in this case, you'll see that number one, the defendant left his car running because he knew, he, he had hoped that he would get out of that church and that he hoped that he would get away. Also, it only takes, if, if somebody is going to commit suicide and they're going to do it with a gun, it only takes one bullet. The defendant armed himself not only with several magazines of the 40 caliber weapon that he chose to carry on that day, but he also had additional magazines. He had a nine millimeter. He had additional weapons in the car. He had additional ammunition in the car. He wasn't suicidal that day. He wanted to kill people that day. And that's what the evidence showed. If somebody really is suicidal and wants to kill themselves, they wouldn't go and involve other people unless that's what they intended to do. The defendant, when he was inside the Burnett Chapel Church of Christ and got shot that day, it wasn't because he decided to take his own life and kill himself. It's because he was struggling over the weapon that he was trying to use to kill Caleb Engel. And he just got shot during that struggle. So the state would submit to you that he was not suicidal on that day. But even if you did believe that the defendant was suicidal on September 24th, 2017, and you believe that he was listening to voices that were inside his head, even the voices in his head told him only to kill himself. He overcame those voices so that he could arm himself in the way that he did and go into that church and try to kill additional people and to kill Melanie Crow. It doesn't matter for purposes of this case what the defendant was going to do after he killed Melanie Crow and after he tried to kill all the additional people in the Burnett Chapel Church of Christ. The defendant wants you to come back with a decision in this case and give him a sentence of life with the possibility of parole. The state is asking you to come back with life without the possibility of parole. The state only had to prove to you one aggravating factor beyond all reasonable doubt, and that is that the defendant, in addition to the murder of Melanie Crow, caused at least two other people to possibly be killed by his actions. Recall from the proof at the trial all of the people who came in here, all of the witnesses who testified, and the state has satisfied that one single aggravating factor by at least 15 times. So we would ask you to place great weight on that aggravating factor when you compare it against the mitigation that you've heard here in court today. Everybody who was present at the Burnett Chapel Church of Christ and witnessed this defendant come into that church after murdering Melanie Crow by shooting her in the face and shooting her four additional or three additional times in her back. Every single one of those people are at risk of developing post traumatic stress disorder. Every single one of them. <coughs> they all bravely came into this courtroom and bravely 
recounted what happened to them and their memories of what the defendant did on that day. And if you're back in the jury deliberation room and you're starting to think, well, a life sentence might be appropriate, I'm going to ask you to remember the tremor in their voices when they came in here to face their monster. And I'm going to ask you to remember the words that Joey Spann said when he talked about the children who once came to that church, the children who are now afraid to come back to church, the children who say, if I go to church today, am I going to die? And then I want you to think again, and I'm going to ask you to come back with life without parole. the argument. Uh, I'm now going to you're going to get a copy of this charge and I'm going to read it to you and then you can begin your deliberations. And we will provide the, to you the all the prior exhibits are available to you as well as the exhibits that were introduced during this trial. In the Criminal Court of Davidson County, Tennessee, Division Three, State of Tennessee versus Emanuel Cadeta Sampson, case number 2018A253, first degree premeditated murder. Fixing punishment of life imprisonment or life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Members of the jury, you have now found the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of first degree premeditated murder as charged in count four of indictment number 2018A523. It is now your duty to determine, within the limits prescribed by law, the penalty which shall be imposed as punishment for this offense. Tennessee law provides that a person convicted of first-degree premeditated murder shall be punished by imprisonment for life without the possibility of parole or by imprisonment for life. A defendant who receives a sentence of imprisonment for life shall not be eligible for release until the defendant has served at least 51 full calendar years of each of each of such sentence a defendant who receives a sentence of imprisonment for life without pro, without parole shall never be eligible for release in arriving at this determination you are authorized to weigh and consider the statutory aggravating circumstance proved beyond a reasonable doubt and any mitigating circumstances which may have been raised by the evidence throughout the entire course of this trial including the guilt finding phase or sentencing phase or both. The jury is the sole judge of the facts of the, and of the law as it applies to the facts in this case. In arriving at your verdict, you are to consider the law in connection with the facts, but the court is the proper source from which you are to get the law. In other words, you are the judges of the law as well as the facts under the direction of the court. The burden of proof is beyond as upon the state to prove any statutory aggravating circumstance beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is that doubt engendered by an investigation of all the proof in the case and an inability after such investigation to let the mind rest easily as to the certainty of your verdict. Reasonable doubt is a high burden but does not mean proof to an absolute certainty. Absolute certainty of guilt is not demanded by the law but moral certainty is required and this certainty is required as to every element of proof necessary to constitute the verdict. Reasonable doubt does not mean a captious, possible, or imaginary doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a whim. It is not a speculation or suspicion. It is not an excuse to avoid the performance of an unpleasant duty, and it is not sympathy. A reasonable doubt is a doubt based upon reason and common sense after careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence in this case. The law makes you, the jury, the sole and exclusive judges of the credibility of the witnesses and the weight to be given to the evidence. The prosecution has introduced what is known as victim impact evidence. This evidence has been introduced to show the financial, emotional, psychological, or physical effects of the victim's death on the members of the victim's immediate family. You may consider this evidence in determining an appropriate punishment. However, your consideration must be limited to a rational inquiry into the culpability of the defendant, not as an emotional response to the evidence. Victim impact evidence is not the same as an aggravating circumstance. 
proof of an adverse impact on the victim's family is not proof of an aggravating circumstance. Introduction of this victim impact evidence in no way relieves the state of its burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt at least one aggravating circumstance which has been alleged. You may consider this victim impact evidence in determining the appropriateness of the sentence only if you first find that the existence of an aggravating circumstance has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt by evidence independent from the victim impact evidence. The defendant has not taken the stand to testify as a witness, but you shall place no significance on this fact. The burden is on the state to prove an aggravating circumstance relied upon. He is not required to take the stand in his own behalf, and his failure to do so cannot be considered for any purpose against him, nor can any inference be drawn from such fact. During the sentencing phase of the trial, you heard the following witness describe you as an expert in his field. Dr. Stephen Montgomery, psychiatry. You are to assess his testimony based upon the same rules instructed by the court during the first, uh, first phase of trial. You heard Dr. Montgomery's testimony via video recording. Consider his testimony as if he testified in person. The expert witness may have testified that he took into consideration certain statements made by person who did not testify during the sentencing hearing. Because the statements were made outside the courtroom, these statements may be used, only, uh, be used by you only for evaluating the expert witness's opinion, testimony, and cannot be relied on as proof of the truth of the matters asserted in such those statements. You are to give the testimony of an expert witness such weight and value as you think it deserves along with all the other evidence in this case. Statutory aggravating circumstance. Tennessee law provides that no sentence of imprisonment for life without the possibility of parole can be imposed by a jury, but upon a, a unanimous finding that the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the statutory aggravating circumstance, which shall be limited to the following. One, the defendant knowingly created a great risk of death to two or more persons other than the victim murdered during the act of murder. Members of the jury, the court has read to you the aggravating circumstance which the law requires you to consider if you find proof beyond be a reasonable doubt. You shall not consider any other facts or circumstances as an aggravating circumstance in deciding whether imprisonment for life without the possibility of parole shall be appropriate punishment in this case. Mitigating circumstances. Tennessee law provides that in arriving at the punishment, the jury shall consider, as previously indicated, any mitigating circumstances raised by the evidence, which shall include but are not limited to the following. One, the defendant had no significant history or, or of prior criminal activity. Two, the murder was committed while the defendant was under the influence of extreme mental or emotional disturbance. Three, the capacity of the defendant to appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct or to conform his conduct to the requirements of the law was substantially impaired as a result of mental disease or defect, which was insufficient to establish a defense to the crime, but which substantially affected his judgment. Four, history of childhood. Five, educational history. Six, performance in a structured environment. Seven, family history and relationships. Eight, any aspect of the defendant's background or character which you believe reduces the defendant's blameworthiness. Nine, any other mitigating factor which is raised by the evidence produced by either the prosecution or defense at either the guilt or sentencing hearing. That is, you shall consider any aspect of the defendant's character or record or any aspect of the circumstances of the offense favorable to the defendant which is supported by the evidence. The defendant does not have to the burden of proving an, a mitigating circumstance. There is no requirement of jury unan, uni, unanimity as to any particular mitigating circumstance or that you agree on the same mitigating circumstance. Verdict. Life imprisonment or life imprisonment without possibility of parole. If you do not unanimously determine that a statutory aggravating circumstance has been proved by the state beyond a reasonable doubt, the sentence shall be life imprisonment. You will write your verdict upon the enclosed form attached hereto and made a part of this charge. The verdict shall be as follows. We, the jury, unanimously find that the punishment shall be life imprisonment. If you unanimously determine that a statutory circumstance um, has been proven by the state beyond a reasonable doubt, you shall, in your considered discretion, 
sentence the defendant either to imprisonment for life without the possibility of parole or to imprisonment for life. In choosing between the sentences of imprisonment for life without possibility of parole and imprisonment for life, you shall weigh and consider the statutory aggravating circumstance proven by the state beyond a reasonable doubt and any mitigating circumstance in your verdict you shall reduce to writing the statutory aggravating circumstance so found and shall return your verdict upon the enclosed form attached hereto and made a part of this charge. The verdict shall be as follows. We, the jury, unanimously find that the state has proven beyond the following listed statutory aggravating circumstance beyond a reasonable doubt. Here list the statutory aggravating circumstance found. You shall then indicate on the enclosed verdict form either <coughs> we, the jury, unanimously agree that the defendant shall be sentenced to imprisonment for life without the possibility of parole, or we, the jury, unanimously agree that the defendant shall be sentenced to imprisonment for life. The verdict must be unanimous and signed by each juror. Take the case, consider all the evidence fairly and impartially, complete one of the two forms, and report your verdict to the court. This is signed by me, uh, judge, and the date is 5-28-2019. Is there anything further from the court, uh, from the state, no. from the no. defense? And you will find attached to your verdict form, uh, your, your verdict, their charge, the two separate verdict forms that you are to, to um, file, fill out. One is punishment for imprisonment for life, has to be signed by the four person and every juror, or punishment for imprisonment for life without the possibility of parole or, impris or imprisonment for life. On that form, you would find the aggravating circumstance, and then you would check which were those verdicts you have, and also sign those. Each of, each juror must sign it. All right. So that ends the uh, this phase of the trial. You may now uh, retire and consider your verdict. Uh, and again, all the um, exhibit, exhibits which you saw previously and exhibits which you've seen now are your, at your disposal. And just uh, notify the court when you've reached the verdict. So you may now go take your notes and uh, let me know when you need something. All right? Thank you. Is there anything further for the state? No. Okay, Ms. Thompson? No. Okay. All right, well, then we'll be at recess until we hear something from the jury.
talks and such. All right, we need to bring Mr. Sampson in. We do have a verdict in this matter. All right, so uh, Mr. Sampson is in the courtroom, and we do have a, a verdict. Just same admonitions that I gave uh, last time. Uh, no display of emotion uh, until the jury is, uh, or at all, but definitely not in front of the jury. So is everybody ready? State ready? Defense ready? Yes. Okay, bring the jury in. Reflect the jury is back in the courtroom, and uh, juror number nine, are you still the four person? Yes, ma'am. And I do understand that you have a verdict in this case. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, well, if you will please stand. And with regard to the punishment for count four, what was your verdict? Uh, we, the jury, unanimously find that the state has proven the following listed statutory aggravating circumstances beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant knowingly created a great risk of death to two or more persons other than the victim murdered during the act of murder. And then what, which box did you check? What was your verdict and punishment? We, the jury, unanimously agree that the defendant shall be sentenced to imprisonment for life without possibility of parole. All right. And did all of the jurors sign that form? Yes, ma'am. All right. If you would please hand it to my court officer. All right, I have a form that tells me you have sentenced Mr. Sampson, uh, that you unanimously agree that the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the aggravating circumstance that they uh, noticed, and that you determined that you un unanimously agree that he should be sentenced to imprisonment for life without the possibility of parole, signed by all jurors, and the date is May the 28th of 2019. If that is your verdict, would you please so signify by raising your right hand? All right, that is a, a unanimous verdict. Thank you very much. Does the state care to poll the jury? Does the state defense care to poll yes, the jury? All right, I will again call the numbers. And juror number one, was that your verdict? Uh, no parole. Yeah, yeah, but, but was, it, was that your verdict? Was it what I read? Was that accurate? Life without the possibility of parole. Yes. Is it? Juror number two. Yes. Okay. Again, three was the alternate. Number four, was that your verdict? Yes. Number five, was that your verdict? Yes. Number seven, was that your verdict? Yes. Number eight, was that your verdict? Yes. Number nine, was that your verdict? Yes. 
Number 12, was that your verdict? Yes. Number 13, was that your verdict? Yes. Number 14, was that your verdict? Yes. Number 15, was that your verdict? Yes. And number 16, was that your verdict? Yes. All right. Well, I want to thank you very much for the, all the time that you have taken with this case. The, uh, the trial is now over, uh, and I want to, again, thank you. Uh, and if you will just step out for one last time, uh, and um, with the court's thanks, and then go with my court officers. Mr. Sampson, if you'll please stand. Mr. Han Sampson, you heard the verdict of the jury uh, last uh, Friday with regard to count four. They found you guilty of first-degree premeditated murder. They have now sentenced you to uh, imprisonment for life without the possibility of parole. Uh, and that was their decision uh, signed by all the jurors. That judgment has now become the judgment of the court. Uh, and if you will pr please prepare the, the order uh, for that. Uh, and then we'll need to set up a sentencing hearing for the remaining counts. Uh, we'll probably need to take a full day. We were looking at sometime in July, but if you'll just get with my clerk so that we will know uh, when everybody can be. I think a full day would be something necessary. All right, Mr. Sampson, you may be excused, and if you'll go with my court officers. I always do the double judgment form. Would you like us to do that? I do the one out, yes, okay. It's a two page. People will not make copies of the back page, I have discovered. So you can get that judgment form. All right, so that is going to end the trial. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you for all your hard work. And uh, again, we're going to set up a, a, a whole day for the sentencing hearing because a lot of people will want to testify. I, I don't know how many you would want, but we need to work out. I was looking at sometime in July, uh, but we'll again set aside a full day for that. All right. Judge, there is one okay. matter. Oh, yes. Now that the trial is concluded, within the parameters of the our ethics, would it be permissible for us to speak with the media if they want to have one? Okay. Keep in mind that there is still a sentencing yes, hearing in this, so keep that in mind within that parameters. I'll, I'll let the uh, council talk, okay? Yes. All right, okay? Thank you. All right. All right, court is in recess until tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm.